Thanks, Mike. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning, everybody who is tuning in online. Um, so my talk is not so much about conservation. Um, it's about some of the research work that's been going on over the last 10, 15 years in Erica pollination. Um, but when I heard Rupert's talk, I immediately thought, OK, fantastic that there's efforts done in growing Erica's in situ, uh, ex situ and trying to to think about how we can uh, protect endangered species, but we really also ought to know what's going on in the field and how these things reproduce, how recruitment of populations happens, um, because we can plant as many ericas back in the wild as we want to, but if, if those planted plants do not reproduce or do not recruit, uh, then our efforts are rather meaningless, I would argue. Um, so that, that is the, the, the link between my perhaps slightly more academic talk and less conservation focused talk and, and what we've been hearing before. Um, there's a lot of work being done in pollination uh, of ericas and I think among the people that are actively involved in that research we, we've partitioned it nicely this morning. Um, so um, I will mostly be focusing on, on scent. Um, I just want to start though with um, Focusing on or highlighting Tony Rebella's work, it's a pity he's not here. I would have liked uh, I would have liked to engage in, in discussions with him. Uh, but this this has really been a, a landmark study, the 1985 work that he of of which he was the first author, and where he defined pollination syndromes in Erica. And these syndromes um, have been used by all of us um, in various ways. And I think one thing I would like to discuss is whether and how to use them in the future. Um, but regardless of how they've been used, uh, Tony and, and his colleagues uh, defined four pollination syndromes in Erica and these were mostly based on, on the shape of the flowers. And that work followed on from Marlott and Stefan Vogel's work uh, before that. Um, we, we now know that through several studies that were probably on non-randomly chosen species that uh, some of these syndrome designations were in fact incorrect and, and that those ideas are really based on, on rather than looking at the plants and thinking what could pollinate them, uh, sitting next to the plants and observing what visits them. And I would argue very, very strongly that that, that kind of work is, is very much needed. So we know that floral shape can sometimes surprise us in terms of what, what actually pollinates plants. Uh, there's also been a lot of or quite a bit of work done by, by Tony Rebello in the 80s and, and colleagues on flower color and that work is continued by, by Nina. Um, I should say the shape work is, is continued by Sam and we, we're going to hear more about those aspects later. Um, in terms of flower color, there's tremendous variation in the genus as you can see from the color plate that, that Mike used in one of his papers. And there's been some idea that perhaps color may be a good predictor of what, what pollinates ericas at a very coarse level, maybe dividing insects versus uh, vertebrate pollinated species, for instance. Um, when it comes to scent, um, uh, Rebello suggested that relatively few erica species are scented, with some exceptions, um, and therefore scent may in fact not be such a useful character when we, when we try and infer what might pollinate species, and, and perhaps scent is I guess these are my words to kind of set up my talk. Uh, scent is maybe a bit uninteresting in Erica. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be cherry picking from a, a meta analysis that I've done um, on, on sense data for species that we've collected so far. Uh, the first, the first thing I want to show is just the frequency distribution of the number of volatiles that we find in these scent samples to, to suggest that perhaps uh, Erica's are more scented than, than we think based on our own human nose. So um, of all the samples that I've analyzed, uh, not a single sample was unscented. Uh, and and most, most samples include at least 10 to 15 volatile compounds. And these are just the compounds that we could identify. I've kept left out the unknown compounds, uh, which make up a very small fraction of the, of the, the bouquet. So I would argue that Erica flowers are often actually scented. Um, so this is a slide that I'm going to show that is going to be recurrent in this short talk. Um, it's a, a multivariate analysis of, of sense data. Um, 
I should really emphasize that the species that, I've, that we've analyzed are a very much a non-randomly selected collection of Erica species. So I, I go out and focus on species which have an interesting scent to the human nose in some cases. Um, but in any case, this is the pattern that we observed among that non-random sample of species. So just generally speaking, uh, you see that the pollinated species representing about six species from various uh, localities. There's a bit of feedback happening, I think. Okay. Um, uh, are forming a nice cluster um, that the bird pollinated species uh, cluster with with leaf scent, so they, they perhaps are effectively unscented, um, and that moth pollinated species seem to cluster in two different areas, and then there's one fly pollinated species in there. So I'll be I'll be sort of cherry picking a few and focusing on a few patterns here. Uh, the first one is um, the transition from um, bird to moth pollination in Erica pluginetti. And that seems to be associated with with a de novo origin of scent. So most most forms of Erica placinetti that are bird pollinated are produce volatiles that are also produced by the leaves and probably have no function in pollinator attraction. Whereas Erica breviflora, which is or placinetti subspecies breviflora, is uh, strongly scented. It produces both more volatiles as well as uh, a higher volatile emission rates. Um, and these, scent, these scented flowers, or the scent of these flowers, is probably an important feature of attracting the, the moth pollinators. Um, and what, what has been instrumental in understanding the role of scent or the evolution of scent has been the phylogenetic framework that is provided by, by Mike and colleagues. And I, it's one of the things I want to thank Mike for and, and also argue that this phylogenetic framework has is providing us with an incredible resource for comparative biology. Um, so this is a phylogenetic tree that shows that scent originated at the same time as, as moth pollination did. Um, the second finding that I want to briefly highlight is the fact that um, two species for which we have uh, evidence that they're pollinated by noctuid moths uh, do not seem to cluster together as the bee pollinator species do, for instance. So I'm talking about Erica denticulata and Erica placinetti subspecies breviflora. Both, both these species, which are um, relatively distantly related, uh, are, are visited and pollinated by the same moth species. Uh, here you see photographs of Helicoverpa armigera, which is both an agricultural pest as well as an indigenous, in South Africa at least, an indigenous moth species that, that pollinates these fragrant ericas and here we have done a little bit we've gone a little bit further than just simply analyzing the scent of these species um, we we've also looked at the antenna responses of helicoverpa moths and and shown that these two erica species attract the same moth species in a completely different manner so the the scent compounds that the moth responds to in the two erica species are completely non-overlapping so it's convergent evolution in terms of its ecology but certainly not in terms of its chemistry. Um, another fun pattern is the fact that the, the scent of Erica denticulata and Erica cylindrica seems to be quite similar. So those do sort of cluster in, in multivariate space. Um, but they actually have different pollination systems. Uh, so Erica denticulata, as mentioned before, is, is pollinated by short-tongued noctuid moths. Uh, whereas Erica cylindrica, at least based on the relatively limited field work that we have done in that system, seems to be mostly pollinated very unusually for Feinbos plant species by bog moths. Um, so they, these two species have highly overlapping scent compounds, perhaps not too surprising given that noctuid moths and hawk moths belong to both to Lepidoptera and, and perhaps are attracted to similar scent compounds. The key difference here is not so much the scent, but it's, it's the floral morphology. So Erica cylindrica has longer tubes, uh, narrow, narrow flowers, but importantly also, and sorry, Sam, I'm stealing your thunder maybe a little bit, um, they have different flower orientation. So we, we did a, a sort of um, quick analysis based on the beautiful uh, color drawings in the, the Baker uh, the Baker book and looked at flower orientation of Erica species in relation to their pollination system. 
Um, and, and we think that the relatively upright orientation of the flowers of Erica cylindrica is a key for, uh, for effective pollination by hawk moths, which would struggle to feed on um, pendant flowers that, that characterize most Erica species. But we'll, we'll, we'll hear much more about that. Uh, very briefly commenting on the scent of the bee pollinated species. So there's relatively little to say about that uh, without going into relatively boring chemistry. Um, in that the species that we've analyzed so far seem to cluster together in a multivariate analysis, uh, but we, we understand very little of the function of the scent compounds uh, of these bee species bee pollinated species, one of the honey bee pollinated species in particular, I should say, one of the things that we do know is that uh, these species that we sampled are, are relatively distantly related. So we, we, we may be looking here at convergent evolution of, of floral scent um, in, in honey bee pollinated species. And then the last uh, pollination system I want to focus on is one that we, we've recently, relatively recently started working in on by virtue of me working in the summer rainfall region. We've started focusing on some of the erica species that occur there, perhaps a little bit less of the focus of this meeting, but nevertheless interesting. And um, here we've observed that these, these white flowers, small flowers uh, are mostly visited by, by flies. And you, you see on this photograph that the flies get pollen on their faces and other body parts. Um, the flowers smell relatively unpleasant. Um, if I have to describe it in human terms, I would use words like sweat, sweaty socks or cheese or that, that kind of sour smell. Um, and what's interesting is that they have this scent in common with several other plant species that, that are distantly related from different plant families. So here you see a Cressula, for instance, um, that has a relatively similar floral morphology as well as a similar scent chemistry. Um, so, so we think that especially these high elevation sites where bee pollinators may be less present. Um, there's a whole guild of plants out there that has adapted to pollination by short tongued flies. Uh, and, and some of these scent compounds, these, these acidic scent compounds are highly characteristic of dung, for instance. So we, we think that uh, possibly these, these flies are, have an innate preference for these smelly scent compounds that they, they may also use, that, that in a preference may also be used in other ecological roles of that species, for instance, finding uh, substrates for, for laying eggs or, or feeding. Uh, so we've done, we've done some functional work in the system, looking at uh, using choice tests between uh, different color plastic models and adding scents to, to models to, to demonstrate that both the flower color and this, this smelly, smelly scent compounds uh, seem to be important for the attraction of these flies and um, uh, also finding out whether it's a particular scent compound or a combination of scent compounds that, that attract flies. Um, I don't think I have time to go into the details of this particular uh, system. So here are just a couple of conclusions. Scent variation. First of all, I would argue scent is most certainly important in, in erica pollination uh, and the variation that we find among the species seems to be non-random. Bird pollinated species are largely unscented apart from the fact that they produce typical green leaf volatiles. Um, moth pollinated species have different functional scent profiles but at the level of compound classes there's actually some overlap. Also highly interesting as far as I'm concerned is that the de novo origin of scent here usually when we look at pollinator shifts and associated phenotypic traits. There's loss of function, for instance, the loss of a particular pigment pathway, but here there seems to be a gain of function. Be interesting to see how that works from a genetic point of view. Um, the convergent scent evolution of bee pollinator species, I think, needs, needs more work to understand what's going on there. And the summer rain for Erica species uh, fits, seem to fit into a, a guild of fly pollinated plant species. And then in terms of discussion topics, I want to emphasize the, the tremendous value of the phylogenetic framework for which we, which we can use for comparative uh, work. So that's maybe not something necessarily that we need to discuss. Um, but something that I think does require some discussion is how to go about the use of Rubella syndrome uh, designation. So there are a couple of comparative studies in the pipeline where we would like to look for how traits evolve in association with pollination systems. 
Um, and you're probably aware of the fact that, that I'm quite critical of using syndromes uh, for that um, without actually confirming the syndrome predictions with actual pollinator observation. So perhaps for some of us who want to be involved in these larger comparative analyses, it's useful to think about how we can effectively use these, these syndrome designations. Thanks very much. But maybe it's useful to have the bulk of the discussion regarding pollination work after the end of the, the trio of talks on reproductive biology. I don't know what people think about that. I'm happy to answer questions. I think that, made, that makes a great deal of sense. We, uh, I'm not sure quite where we are for time because I <coughs> this thing recorded. Eight minutes, Eight minutes too. Yeah. Is that good or bad? <laughs> Weird. That, that is remarkably good. <laughs> yeah. just, very practically, so you said 20 species is known to pollinate them. Does it mean also you have the, the chemical profiles for those 20? Not for all so of them. Repeat, repeat the question. Oh, thank you. So the, the, the question from the audience is, um, on my last Outlook slide, I suggested that the pollination system of only roughly about 20 species is known, I would say published, in the published literature at least. Uh, do we have to send profiles for these 20 species? No, not for all of them, uh, so for, for a handful of them. Um, I should say that, that that number 20 comes from trawling the literature. So I think in, in various people's notebooks, there's probably a lot more known. Uh, so I'm sure Anina has, has data on bird pollination for more species. Sam will have data on various pollination systems in Erica species. So I think there's a lot of casual observations that perhaps that's also something we can discuss that how, how to bring that information together. Uh, maybe it's less rigorous in nature, but nevertheless very useful, I think. Um, I think that takes into people's notes what I wanted to say. Is, uh, how do we as a community uh, uh, help with that information? Because it's not seen as proper scientific work, it's more anthropological, but we're always talking to each other and it's not getting recorded. I think, Mike, if you could add that as a, an outcome or potential outcome is when we are working with our elders and people in the room here, how do we extract that grey matter or that grey knowledge into a place that we can also use it? Because that's going to be the place where we can springboard or for additional applied research. So if, if I can translate Rupert's question or suggestion is how to use citizen science data, for instance, on... on Not just citizen science. Um, so Sam's in the paper. We've got access to the paper. Sam's got other ideas that she's extracted from the field, which is not yet there. So, yeah, how, how do we get that information? And I think about TED, which is like decades of like really important ecological um, observations, um, but we don't have. So, so citizen science as well as contributions by scientists of unpublished data, uh, what, what to do, how to tap into that or how to access that? Field data. Yeah. Field data. And I, 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 I would argue that it's, it's both impossible and unnecessary to do rigorous pollination studies of all 900 Erica species, mm -hmm. but totally. at the same time, um, we need at least some ideas from such rigorous studies to be able to see how good our predictions are or how good our relatively casually collected data are. Um, so there's, there's a balance that need, needs to be found, I think. Uh, great talk, Timo, and great to see you. And uh, well, my, my question is just a, a, well, a curiosity or something that, that um, uh, uh, raised my eyebrows when you when you put the example of, of this um, Erika Placanetti Breviflora thing from, from bird to, to moth pollination and those two forms, because I've noticed that also in Erika coccinia, uh, there is a form of, of uh, I think it's called Erika albiflora that you can see in Garcia's Pass in Riversdale. And it's similar to that. And, and well, I, I would, 
I mean, a, a good bet that, that, that is also moth pollinated. Are the flowers scented? I don't know. I, it's, it, I see the parallelism of, uh, you know, the flowers of Placanetia are similar to those of Coccinia, but then this form, Albiflora, I'm sure Jan Flock uh, knows the species, is very common in Garcia's past. Looks like Erica Coccinia, but it's like the Breviflora. It's white flowers and they, they short flowers. So, very interesting. Um, so I would say the, that the presence of scent, what we humans would call sweet scent, which in chemical terms probably translates into a lot of aromatics, seems to be a relatively good predictor of moth pollination. So um, one could maybe check herbarium labels to see whether any of the collectors have noted that scent. In, in Erica Placanetti subspecies Breviflora, as well as Erica denticulata, the, the scent is not periodical. So it's not only switching on in the evening, which is characteristic of, of some moth pollinated species. And that, um, so, yeah, well, one could look at whether daytime collectors have, have written notes on that. That would be a first indication, I would say, of um, that it could be moth pollinated. Yeah, well, the, the, to me, the interesting thing is that I, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm seeing kind of two parallel, parallel transitions, both in Coccinia and Placanetti, from, from large red flowers to small white flowers. Certainly interesting, yeah. Okay. Also, Anyone has got a good master student. Thank you. <laughs>